Welcome back Life Science Learners to our final segment this day. We were looking at the impact that humans have on the environment by looking at loss of biodiversity. We spent some time looking at solid waste disposal, we've looked at the different types of solid waste and we attempted to solve a question where we looked at how the impact of recycling can reduce the impact that solid waste has on the environment. In this segment we want to recap on the loss of biodiversity and we need to attempt to apply some of that in the context of a question. So let's recap on the loss of biodiversity and let's apply some of our understanding to a question. So in this segment earlier on we looked at what was biodiversity, we've looked at the importance of maintaining biodiversity, we discussed what are the threats to biodiversity are, we spent some time looking at habitat destruction in terms of how that occurs. We looked at bio poaching as an impact on biodiversity and we've discussed what alien plant invasion is and how that becomes quite expensive to maintain. In this segment, let's look at the impact of poaching by applying our understanding to the conservation of animals in South Africa. So the question reads, study the table showing a summary of the rhino poaching incidents in South Africa from 2006 to 2010. And guys, you would know that there's been a lot of poaching of rhinos that has happened in the last 20 years. And the government of South Africa, along with South African National Parks Association, has done significant conservation work in maintaining and protecting these precious animals that we have. However, because of such a lucrative industry that, that thrives on the trade of these animals and the products of these, we've seen a significant decrease of some of our major uh, big five animals. So in terms of elephant product, ele elephants, rhinos and even lions have experienced significant poaching in the last 20 years. So let's look at these stats and let's try and understand the impact that poaching has had in South Africa in the context of rhinos. So here the, the table below shows you the different provinces and it shows you the number of animals that have been poached over 2006 till 2010. So we've got the Kruger National Park, we've, we've seen numbers from Limpopo, Mpumalanga Northwest, the Eastern Cape, Free State, KwaZulu-Natal, Northern Cape, and these have been totaled as illegally hunted. So we do know that there's a process of culling that takes place, which is a natural process where certain conservation parks need to control the number of animals that are in that confined space. But we know that some of a lot of the animals that are killed have been illegally killed or poached. And that is done for the trade of certain parts of these animals. So this table shows you the comparative stats. And what is alarming is to look at the totals that have gradually increased since 2006. And we're seeing that there's been a steady increase in these numbers. And it's alarming to consider that, you know, we are possibly facing a possible threat to many of our indigenous animals because of poaching. So let's look at the first question. This question has been adapted from Mind the Gap Chapter 11. I think it's a very crucial question in terms of understanding the application of poaching. So the first question refers to how many rhinos were illegally hunted in 2009? And if we go back to that table, if we look at in 2009, I think the question points to were illegally hunted in 2009. So in 2009, we can see that a total of 122 were illegally hunted. And so that is a question that requires that you read through a table and you extrapolate information from that. So in this case, there were 1,122, my apologies, that were illegally hunted in the year 2009. Suggest so three ways in which the poaching of rhinos can be stopped. So guys, we know that education and awareness about rhino poaching is something that we've been discussing at school. However, there are active programs that have been taken by the conservation authorities in South Africa. And so these challenges have been met with and we've had to embrace new laws, we've had to embrace new techniques to conserve and to be more proactive around preventing these animals from the mercy of poachers. So let's look at what has been done. So we do know that because of these alarming stats and the steady increase, the conservation authorities have had to act very fast and very effectively despite the challenges that they face. 
So, what must be done, or what has been done? So we know that there's been certain programs where the horns are sawn off. And this is essentially a, a controlled process of removing the horns of these rhinos when they are much younger. And, they, and, the, and the idea behind this is to prevent these rhinos from being poached upon. So, yes, it is sad to see a rhino without a horn, but it is also a point where the rhino is protected and it can survive. Unfortunately, the horns are, are not significantly important to the rhino in terms of its, its livelihood. It can survive without a rhino horn, but it also means that it is being spared from being poached. However, we do know that some poachers are malicious and because the rhino, the horn has been removed, they sometimes tend to poison these rhinos in, 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 in kind of disappointment that the rhino's horn has been removed. So we still do face the impact that this has, but it significantly reduced the numbers. We also know that there have been, ta there have been pro tags that have been fitted into these rhinos as collars to monitor their movement. And so if we can monitor the rhino movement in, our, in their natural habitats, you know, we're able to track where they are, we're able to monitor their numbers and their positions so that should there be a movement of them or a lack of movement of these, they can be tracked down to a specific location and again, either assisted or necessary steps taken to protect them. We also know that there are heavy penalties like imprisonment that have been, uh, that have been instituted instead of fines. So we know that sometimes the, the monetary fines are significantly uh, inconsequential to the impact that these have had on the rhinos. So we know that heavy fines have been in the past been issued to, uh, to people that have been caught with these horns. However, the laws have been changed and these include imprisonment and, and which has significant uh, consequences on reducing the number of, of rhinos being poached. However, there are new techniques that have been involved where the rhino horns have been DNA fingerprinted or the horn, or rhinos have been DNA fingerprinted. And this is essentially to be able to link a possible poacher to a site where a rhino has been poached. So in the past, when a poacher was caught with a horn, it was very difficult for us to understand which rhino that horn belonged to. And it's important that the law system is able to identify and link a horn and a poacher to a site where that has been um, poached from. And so that has provided significant assistance to the, the judiciary in terms of linking people or linking poachers to a site where a rhino has been poached. The next question, describe the general trend observed in the table. And if you look at the table, you can see that the general trend is that if we look at the total numbers in, 24, in 20, 2006, and if we compare that to in 2010, we can see that these numbers have significantly increased. So if we look at the total numbers, there have been a significant increase from 2006 six to 2010. And this talks to what has happened in terms of the international trade of these horns uh, in terms of the demand for them. So we've seen that there's been an increase from the year 2008 to the year 2010. Okay, by what percentage did the poaching of rhino incidences increase in the northwest from 2008 to 2010? So it's important that we identify in the question the province and the question wants us to calculate the percentage. So let's look at the table and we've got to look at the time period which is 2008 for the province of Northwest. So when we look at the table, so we're looking at the Northwest province and it's from 2008 to 2010 and so we've got to identify what is the increase of this, these numbers. So it increased from 7 all the way to 44. Let's calculate what this means as a percentage of increase. So if you plug in the numbers you can see that it's 44 over 7 times 100 because we need to calculate that as a percentage. And this shows that it is increased by 628 times. This is a significant increase in the number of rhinos. So it's, it's, it's a radical increase, almost six times, and hence 
That's a significant concern in that number. The next question, use the data in the table and draw a histogram to show the number of rhinos poached in each year from 2006 to 2010. So again, the question requires that we draw a histogram. And remember that we've got to apply all the rules that we need when drawing a graph. So if we, it's going to go back to the question. So we've got to find out the poach from, so it's the, draw a histogram for the, to show the number of rhinos poached from each year. So we've got to know the total number from each year in that period. So if we go back to that graph, so we've got to go look at these values. And I'm going to keep my graph up here. And I've plotted the graph for you, but I want to show you the mark allocation for this. So it's important that we first give the graph a heading. So this is a histogram. And I'll remind you that a histogram is a bar graph with no spaces. So essentially, it is a graph where the bars have no spaces. So if it was a bar graph, we will see that there would be clear spaces between them. But the question wants us to draw a histogram, so we would notice that the bars are connected between one to the next. Again, so we've illustrated that it's a histogram, and we've got to have both the dependent and the independent variable in this. So the dependent variable is the number of rhino horns that were poached, and this was in the time period from 2000 to 2010. So we clearly see that the heading has both the dependent and the independent variable in it. We had to also create a scale on the y-axis. And for me to do that, I had to look at what the lowest number was. And we can see that the lowest number is 24. And the highest number is, um, if we go up to that, is uh, 247. So we're looking at approximately 250. So our scale needs to be in a scale of 50s. And I've chosen a units of 50. So I've gone from 0 all the way in, in values of 50 to 250. And I've labeled this as my dependent variable. And in this case, it is the total number of rhino poaching incidences, which I've plotted on the y, on the y axis. Our independent variable goes on to the x axis. And in this case, we have time. And that time is given in the unit of years. And that's important for us to to identify that the unit is years and the variable is time. So guys, when plotting a bar graph, you've got to make sure that, uh, sorry, a histogram, you've got to make sure that these bars are all equal in width. And we can see that they are clearly labeled. And in this case, I've not used a key, but I have labeled the bars on the x-axis in terms of the time period. If you, if you chose to indicate the labels as A, B, and C, then you would have to put in a key here where you would indicate that A is the time period, in this case, the year 2006, and B would be 2007. So it's important that you clearly identify which bars represents, in this case, which year. And then you would have to plot these values out. And if we go to the first one, you can see that in the year 2006, we had 24 that, was, that were poached. So this would take us to a value of 24. And you would draw that bar out neatly using a ruler. And then you would plot the next one. And you would eventually plot this graph knowing that you've plotted all five time periods. And you would have labeled them accordingly. So guys, let's read the next question. The next question talks about um, the rooibos plant. And let's read through that question and answer some of the questions based on that. We know that the rooibos is a indigenous plant. And this plant is grown in South Africa. It grows in South Africa naturally. And it's been commercially used as a, as a, as a tea. But it also has a lot of medicinal properties. So let's look at the context of this. So the rooibos plant is used to make herbal tea. South Africa is the only commercial grower of rooibos plants in the world. There's a huge market for this. Rooibos tea is a caffeine-free beverage with health and medicinal benefits. 
some of the benefits of drinking rooibos tea are that it is a it has a calming effect it helps with digestion and it helps with infant colic so you would have probably seen lots of varieties of rooibos tea and so it's an indigenous herb it's produced in the cape fynbos and it grows naturally there and it's a huge potential income for the south african tea industry however there's a, a demand internationally for it and we see that this creates an opportunity for it to create uh, exploitation so let's look at the questions based on this so the first question is describe two ways in which over exploitation of plants such as the rooibos impacts on other life forms in the environment and as we discussed we refer to biodiversity early on and remember that every organism has a specific role and position that it occupies the removal of these will impact on the food chain and it'll impact on the biodiversity so if the rooibos plant is over harvested think of the impact that it would have on the insects that live on this on the on the bees and the on the birds that rely on the flowers of these plants so let's try and understand what happens when we remove a species from its natural environment okay so the rooibos plant as we discussed you'll find that these plants can become extinct firstly because we over exploit them it could lead to the loss of the biodiversity of that environment remember that each plant or organism plays a specific role in its food chain in turn affecting food webs which can be destroyed when a single organism is removed <coughs> excuse me it could lead to the degradation of the environment because this plant could have a specific role in its environment removal of these plants because of exploitation could also mean that there's nothing to hold the soil and so we find that there's erosion on the surface and if too many of these plants are removed we could end up with an, a significant amount of plant topsoil being removed and so that would mean there's increased runoff of water it also could mean that other alien invasive plants can now inhabit these areas which were previously inhabited by the fein boss so we would in, unintentionally upset the balance not only of the ecosystem but as well as the oxygen and carbon dioxide and this could if we go further lead to some sort of global warming if too many plants are removed and we see that the impact of a single species has a significant uh, impact on the environment on the biome and on the greater scheme the the entire globe so guys we've looked at human impact on the environment in the context of food security we've looked at human impact on the environment in terms of the loss of biodiversity and we've also discussed in this segment the impact that solid waste disposal has on the environment so guys let's be conscious about the environment this is there for us for the future we need to protect it we need to be conscious about the decisions we make so when you when we walk around appreciate the environment that we have consider what happens when we leave litter and so imagine what happens when the disposal of waste accumulates in the environment so guys conserve the environment we live in remember the 3 Rs recycle reuse and reduce from my side all the best stay safe stay calm and be wise